Lord, I pray this morning what will happen in this place is that we'll, we'll just worship you in spirit and truth because that's what you're calling us to do. That we'll just empty ourselves of stuff that maybe are peripheral, they don't need to be in our minds right now, and we'll just give you all of our attention because you are worthy of praise. So praise is on our lip this morning in this place, Lord. We want to just lift you up because you deserve it. Thank you. Let's sing this together. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. Faithful you have been and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me. And it's why I sing your praise will never be on my lips. I'll never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips. I'll never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips. I'll never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips. Never be on my lips. Thank you, Lord. You fall to the orphan. Your kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness. Your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing being in white, bringing beauty from ashes. You will have your bride, free of all her guilt, and rid of all her shame, and known by her true name. That's why I sing your praise, and live be on my lips, live and be on my lips, your praise. Never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be you will be praised, and you will be praised, and you will be praised, with angels and saints we sing worthy on you, Lord, and you will be praised. You will be praised with angels and saints. We say worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised, yes. You will be praised with angels and saints. We say worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised. You will be praised with angels and saints. We say worthy. That's why I sing your praise will and let it be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will and let it be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will and let it be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will and let it be on my lips, never be on my lips. Thank you, Lord. You have reason to praise the Lord this morning? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. We do praise you today, Lord. The Spirit of God just fall on this place today. We know that there's a lot we can learn, a lot we can pick up on. We know as you speak to us that there's things that uh, you want us to hear. And so, Lord, our hearts and our minds are open right now. I pray that for all of us. We just give you this time because it's holy ground. You're here with us right now. We know that. Let's sing. 
the Holy Spirit reigned down rain down low comforter and friend how we need your touch again and Holy Spirit rain down rain down let your power let your voice be heard come and change our hearts as we stand on your word holy spirit rain down and holy spirit again Holy Spirit rain down rain down let your power fall let your voice be heard come and change our hearts as we stand on your word Holy Spirit
a time of your word, Lord, again, that our hearts and our minds will hear you. I believe that you're worthy as you gave your life for us, as you shed your blood for us, gave your body, that I think that you have done way more than we could ever imagine, that somehow it, it would be okay for us right now, be just because of that alone, uh, Lord, that we would just say, this time is yours, Lord, we're here to listen to you, everything that you say. And take your word and put it deep down inside of us, Lord, in our hearts and our minds, and that we would, we would make a difference in the world around us because today, Lord, is a day that we come to worship you, I come to listen to you, come to be changed and transformed by you as you speak to us today. Lord, I pray for Pastor Jeremiah as he teaches again, that he will speak your word to us. And Lord, we'll just know your presence here today like we already do. You are an awesome, amazing, caring merciful God. We praise you today, Lord. All of God's people said together, amen. Please be seated. Amen. Amen. Well, if you are just joining us, we are in the midst of a, a mini sermon series of sorts. Uh, uh, kind of the summary is, is kind of a standalone uh, sermon series is, is kind of how I treat them. Uh, the way that I think of, of preaching years is from the school year, so kind of August to May. And so we're just coming out of a year, we just finished up in May, in talking about the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, and that was really important for us to go through, I think, in the midst of, of 2020, looking at the fact that God is sovereign and that his providence is in all these and through all things. And we did that through the, the books of Genesis, and we looked at, at the book of Romans as well, the letter of Romans. In this sermon series that we're in right now, we're in week two of a five-week series entitled Grace Alone, and we're, we're unpacking the question of what it means when we say we are saved by grace alone. Alone, And so we're, we're growing in the gospel. We're trying to understand more and more, unpacking what is it exactly that God did for us in the gospel? What is it that God has done? And so it really offers, uh, offers us a nice hinge point because it allows us an opportunity to look back into Romans of what we just covered in terms of the sovereignty of God. And it also allows us an opportunity to look forward in the preaching year to come in August, uh, mid-August, we're going to start a new preaching year, a new theme in the glory of God. So last year, we talked about the sovereignty of God. This upcoming year, uh, starting in a few weeks, uh, mid-August or so, we're going to be looking at the glory of God. Why does God sovereignly rule all things according to his providence and his will and his decrees? Why does he do this? And starting in August, we're going to see that it is for the glory of God. We're going to go to the book of Exodus, and we're going to see that God saves the nation of Israel for his glory so that he will be worshipped and praised. Then we're going to go into Advent season uh, during December. And then the first part of January 2022, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John. And we're going to be looking at the theme of God's glory throughout. So this sermon series in grace alone allows us to talk about Romans, allows us to talk about the Gospel of John, and it's kind of this in-between point 
Uh, we're going to be in some other passages as well, uh, but that's kind of just to give you a kind of a, a, kind of a preview of where things are. Uh, the, the, what we're going through specifically, the doctrines of grace, there's five doctrines of grace. And last week, we uncovered and unpacked the first one, uh, which was total depravity. My wife is bringing me a tissue. Pardon me for just a moment. Thanks, honey. Uh, sometimes the, the worship sets make my eyes a little sweaty, so I have to, I have to pause, and I don't want to be sniffling the entire time into my microphone. Um, so we looked at the, the question of what was our condition before we were regenerated by the Holy Spirit? And the reason why we're doing this, and this is really important for me, that my prayer for you to understand, is that when we talk about our condition, this totally depraved condition that we looked at last week, it's not done for the, the purpose of beating ourselves up over what we were. It's to understand the weight, the magnificence, the glory of the salvation that we have. To understand the work of the physician who healed me. When I understand the sickness that I was in, and I understand that to greater depths, then my gratitude goes deeper and my worship goes higher so that when I sing amazing grace, my chains are gone, I have been set free. When that happens, that that's the secret to deep worship. It has very little or nothing to do with the way the pastor's dressed or what kind of outfit he wears or what kind of shoes he has or whether or not there's smoke machines and skinny jeans on the stage. It has has little, nothing to do with that. Deep worship and intimacy with God comes from your understanding of what God did for you in salvation. Where were you and where did God deliver you to? The, the further those things are understood apart in relation to each other, the depth of my depravity and the greatness of God's salvation, the deeper your worship experience will be. And that's the, what we're after here a heart that is filled with gratitude and worship toward God and understanding these things, these doctrines of grace. And so there's a blessing here. And for some of you, I was so blessed last week after going through and, and talking about the doctrine of, of total depravity that my, my, because my concern as a pastor in sharing those things and talking about them is that people walk away feeling discouraged. And, and that's not the intent. And I was so blessed to hear, even as I was having conversations with Pastor John last week about somebody walking up to him and saying, I just felt freedom. I felt free in what God has done for me. That's it. That's what I pray and I hope that through these five weeks uh, that you get, is a, there's, there's a blessing here. And so for many of you, you came up to me afterwards and said, man, Pastor, yeah, this, is a, this is a great refresher. It's a great reminder of what God has done for me. And that's amazing that we're just kind of soaking in the grace of God. And for others of you, the things that we'll cover this morning, the things that we'll cover next week and for the next two weeks, for some of you, these will be new things. Even for some of you that have been raised in church uh, your entire life, you've been a Christian for years, the things that we're going to talk about are new. This is a, a new way of understanding things. And there's going to be some wrestling. And, and I want you to be okay with that. I want you to go, but I want you, I hope my prayer for you is that you see that the things that we're talking about are arising from the text. It's not that we're starting with a system and looking to, I'm looking to defend the system. I want you to see that the things that we're talking about are arising out of the passages of Scripture and that the story of the Bible is the story of God's salvation for you. And so this is really important for us to understand as his people because the Bible spends so much time in talking about where we were and what God has done for us and where we're going so that he receives the glory. He receives it. That the gospel is not Jesus plus Jeremiah equals salvation. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. I don't add to this. This isn't some kind of cooperative effort. Did I respond genuinely of my own free will to Jesus and him choosing me? Yes, but all of, the, all of that decisive factor is on God, that I have been saved by grace and by grace alone. So there's blessings here, and I, and I, hope, that you, I hope that you stick with it. I hope that if you find that some of the things that we're going to be talking about are challenging you, I hope that you walk through it and see that that's what the passage is saying and not jettison it or reject it because of some previously conceived philosophical uh, insinuation that you think it's saying, but to hear it out to the end because there's blessing here. Uh, last thing I'll say before I turn to the, the sermon is that uh, when I first came into the contact with the doctrines of grace many years ago, I was in North Carolina. I was attending a church 
great church, Faith Evangelical Bible Church, small uh, country church in North Carolina, came into contact with the doctrines of grace and really wrestled with them for a long time. Uh, I, I came kicking and screaming into these doctrines. Uh, some people don't have that experience. Uh, but for me, that I, 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 didn't, I didn't like what they were insinuating about God. In fact, I remember laying, laying up, and this was even before my oldest daughter, Lily, was born. I remember laying up at night uh, in bed and, and praying to God and saying, God, I feel like I don't even know you. And I re- was reading scripture for the first time, and I was trying to to understand how I was raised in this Baptist church and how I understood how salvation worked was that I chose God and God responded. And now I was being confronted with passages that said, no, actually God chose me and my response of choosing him was just that, a response of me choosing him. And I struggled with that. I I didn't like the idea that my human will was not ultimately self-determined. That there was something that happened to me before my choice. I didn't like that idea. I didn't like that it insinuated that God chooses some, and what we're going to talk about today is unconditional election, that God chooses some. I didn't like the idea that it insinuated that God is unjust and that the justice of God came into view. And and how do I understand this in relation to the Bible says that that God is just, and I struggled with those things. And I think through Bible college at Moody, I was still trying to figure those things out. And I think by the time that at my senior year, I was starting to settle that this is what the text is saying. And if there's a problem, the problem isn't with the text. The problem is with me. And so I laid myself open before God as I went to seminary. I laid myself open before God. And that was really the time in my life where I said, Father, I want you to prune me. Cut from me what thoughts, what theology, what things in my life you don't want so that I can bear fruit for you. Take the, your words, take the words of your son, and cut me. Cut from me what is not accurate. And, and that was the most significant time of growth. And if I could go back to that 22-year-old Jeremiah, who was wrestling with these doctrines, this is what I would say to him. I, I would say to him, allow the Father to prune you with his word. Allow him to speak, and to cut, and to move. Allow, put yourself underneath the text and allow the doctrines of grace to speak to you because there's food here, there's blessing here, there's riches and there's gold here if you'll receive it. And I hope to share those with you this morning. So this morning, last week we talked about the doctrine of total depravity, the first doctrine of grace. Doctrine of total depravity, perhaps not the best usage, but it comes from the, 50, uh, the, from the 1500s. Uh, Synod of Dort, I think it's 1500s if my, if my dates are correct in church history. Uh, the Synod of Dort, total depravity, simply meaning that, that we are not, it's not that we are all as bad as we could be, but that sin has totally affected us in every aspect of who we are. And that the unregenerate person left to themselves doesn't choose God, left to their own free will. The natural mind doesn't want the things of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Left to themselves, we reject God. We don't think choosing God is a good idea. That's the doctrine of total depravity. This morning, we're looking at unconditional election. And what I would like to do this morning is talk about four things about what this means. The doctrine of unconditional election. And then after those four things, I want to talk to you at the end about what the benefits are of this doctrine. So four things about what the doctrine of of unconditional election means. Okay, so first, what does election mean when we say this? It means that God chooses before the foundation of the world whom he will save. You can see already, if you're unfamiliar with this, why this becomes something that people wrestle with. Election means that God chooses before the foundation of the world whom he will save. And then if you're thinking, well, I need to put a pen in that in terms of timeline, before Genesis 1-4. And again, I don't want you to think that I'm making this up or this is a system that I'm looking to defend. I want you to see that this is coming from the text. This is what Scripture teaches. And so I initially had like 10 verses and 10 passages I wanted to take you to to prove, to show you that this is what the passage, this is what Scripture teaches. Um, I I narrowed it down to five. So the first point, I have five verses. These aren't necessarily the best. These are just the ones that that I enjoy and the ones that are, are perhaps my favorite and that I like. Uh, the first one comes from Revelation 13, 8. The, 
uh, the, the context of Revelation 13 here is that this beast is being worshipped. And then in verse 8, it says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship this thing, except everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So when were these names written? Before the foundation of the world. When was this book of the life of the Lamb who was slain? When was that book written? Before Genesis 1-4. God doesn't already know. God has already taken an action of writing in the Lamb's book of life those names who would be saved. But it's not just in Revelation chapter 13 that we find this. It's all throughout Scripture. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. Even as he chose us. Let me pause here. He chose what? What is the object of his choosing? Us. It's not that God is simply choosing the pathway. It's not that just he's choosing Jesus as the pathway to the Father. He does that, yes. But he chooses us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. Let me pause here again. If you ever come to a place where the doctrine of predestination and election causes you to question the love of God, you need to pause, you need to stop, you need to back up. You've made a misstep somewhere. Because the passage says that he does this in love. What motivates God to choose, to elect, to predestine people for his glory and for heaven is love. The doctrine of predestination and election should never cause a child of God to question God's love for humans. The story of Scripture is not the story of humans pursuing God. The story of Scripture is the story of God pursuing humans. So in love he did this. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And you're going to, see, you're going to hear me repeat this through these passages. His will, not mine. Through the purpose of his will. That God has saved us by grace alone. We see this not only. So there's two. There's three more for this point. Now, Acts 13, 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, when they heard the gospel presented, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So this is the cause and the fact. As many as were appointed, or we could say as many as were elected or chosen to eternal life, the result is that they believed. The belief arises as a result of the election, of the choosing. This is what we heard last week from Jesus in John's gospel, when Jesus says, no one can come to me unless my father draws them. And all that come to Jesus, Jesus takes with him. He loses none of them. The handoff, the exchange rate between the father and the son is 100%. No one is dropped. And so as many as were appointed to salvation, believed. So why would God orchestrate this in such a way that it is his choosing and his election that causes and results in belief. Here's why. Because in it, he receives all of the glory. Which means that when I stand before the throne of God, I don't get to say that the the thing that caused my salvation, the thing that initiated it, was that Jeremiah was smarter than his neighbor. That I figured it out. That it's based in my will or my IQ or my heart was just a little bit more, it was just a little better than my neighbor's. And that's the reason why I was able to figure this out and somebody else wasn't. I don't get to say any of that. What I get to say before the throne is that, Father, apart from you opening my eyes and giving me a new heart, choosing me as your son, I would have continued to reject you. So all glory, honor, and praise belong to God. All credit belongs to him. And the la- uh, two more here, uh, both coming from the Gospel of John. Um, you did not choose me, Jesus says, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. And so the point here that Jesus is making in John 15 isn't that there's not in any sense a choice that a human is making of their free will to choose him. It's not the point he's making. The point here is that the choice that matters is Jesus' choice of us as his disciples. My choice of Jesus is a response to the fact that he has chosen me. That's grace. That's what we mean when we say that we are saved by grace alone. Not based on merit, not based on works, not based on something internal in Jeremiah or in you. 
and that all glory and honor and praise belong to the Father. And we see this here again, John chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. But you do not believe. Okay, so Jesus, and this is a refrain, and we're going to see this when we, in January when we slow down and we're going to go through the Gospel of John more uh, systematically. But you do not believe. Why? Because you're not among my sheep. Notice the order. Let me pause here for a second. Notice the order. Jesus says, the reason why you do not have faith and repentance and belief is because you're not one of my sheep. If you were one of my sheep, then you would have faith, belief, and repentance. Notice the order. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. That's the call of salvation. And I know them and they follow me. So I recognize that this goes against what many Christians have come to believe about God. Many Christians believe that God's choosing of them is a response to our choosing. We like to think of the human will as being the thing that is ultimately determinative. The thing that is self-determinative, the thing that matters the most, is the choice of the human. That's, that's modern-day Christianity in America. It's all about human will, human choice, human effort. It's all about you. It's about you becoming your best life now and you exi- you know, exemplifying all the things that, you know, you can be. And what we see in Scripture is the exact opposite. It is not the choice of humans that is primary. It is the choice of God. But humans don't like that. We don't like the fact that there's a choice above mine that is sovereign to me. And so we rebel against this idea of election. Throughout the Gospel of John, we're going to see come January. And throughout the book of Exodus, We're going to see that God chooses the nation of Israel, even in Deuteronomy, he says this, not because of how amazing the nation of Israel was. Moses says this emphatically, God didn't choose you because you were holy and faithful. You are a stiff-necked people. God chose you simply because he chose you. It's based according to his will and his pleasure. God has mercy on whom he has mercy and compassion upon whom he has compassion. It is the prerogative and the choice of God as to who he will do this for. So notice where Jesus places belief here in this verse in the order of salvation. Jesus says the reason you don't have faith and belief is because they aren't his sheep. He says this even of Judas. Belief and faith in Jesus, repentance is the result of being in the flock of God, not the cause of it. So election means that God chooses before the foundation of the world who will be his sheep. That is the reason why God says their names are written in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Our genuine and real choice of God is the result of him choosing us. It wasn't forced. My choice of God was real, was genuine, was authentic. Why? Because he took out of Jeremiah a heart of stone and put into me a heart of flesh, that heart of flesh that can now exercise faith and repentance in him. This is what this means, brothers and sisters, is that salvation is entirely the work of God. He gets all of the credit and the honor and the praise and the glory for it. So what do we mean by unconditional election? We mean that God chooses before the foundation of the world whom he will save. Now let's turn our attention to the word unconditional. What do we mean by unconditional? This means that there is no condition of the human that causes God to choose them. No condition. Unconditional election is not based on human work human merit, uh, something I did that my, my, my neighbor just doesn't have. No, God's choice in election is not determined by human will, is what the passage teaches us. It is determined by the will of God. Let's look at John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Let me pause here. So those who would disagree with the position that I am advocating for here, those that would fall in the Arminian camp, would look at this passage and I think plausibly say and make a a good argument from John chapter 1, verse 12. They would say, look, to as many as received him, who believed in his name, the result is that he caused them to become children of God. And that's where the reason why people who hold to the doctrines of Arminian hold its belief and then birth. They would go to John chapter 1, verse 12. And I can see what they're I can see what they're saying. I don't think that they're crazy. However, this verse can also be interpreted that the belief is the result of them being chosen by God. It is the fruit, it is the evidence. The fact that they have faith and repentance and belief arises out of the fact that they have been chosen by God. So how do we interpret it? Which way do we go? Is it birth and then belief? 
or belief and then birth, whose will is ultimately determinative? Which one do we put at the pinnacle? So we're going to break the tie, I would say. We can do it in one of two ways. First thing we can do is we can look at the next verse to see whether or not John explains what he's talking about to shed further light. Is there something in the immediate context that tells me how I'm supposed to interpret this? The second thing we can do is then look at the rest of the Gospel of John to see whether or not John in his Gospel comes back and explains what he's talking about. The first one we'll do today. The other one we'll do in January as we walk through uh, the Gospel of John. So this next verse in verse 13 goes on to explain what he's talking about. Who were born? These people were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Whose will is determinative here? God's will. The will of the human is a response to God, not the other way around. It is the birth that causes the belief. And this is what John says here. So when we say that election is unconditional, we are saying that it is God's choice is not based on the will of a human. John 1.13, it's not based on the will of the human. It is based on the will of God. Let me give one more example of this before we go to our third point. In John chapter 9, he says this, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 12, he says this, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our father, forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and they had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, let me pause here, and that works includes any faith that Jeremiah's dead, unregenerate, enslaved heart can, can muster, can foster, not because of works, not because of foreseen works. It is not as though God looks through the corridors of time and foresees all of the good works that Jacob would do and then chooses him based on that. No, this passage is saying it's not based on works at all. Not because of works, not past works, present works, future works, but because of him who calls. She was told that the older will serve the younger. And so this brings us to a very important point of clarification that we, we must make and, and we need to understand. We are not saying that salvation is unconditional. This is important. Salvation is conditioned. You say, in what sense is salvation conditioned? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. It is conditioned on faith in Christ. If you do not have faith in Christ, you do not have salvation. That condition of faith is brought about because God chooses us. He gives us new birth, new life, creates a new heart in us. He creates the certain conditions that are required for salvation, such as repentance, faith in Jesus, obedience to Jesus' commandments. So if somebody says, okay, great, so it doesn't matter then. So if I'm, I'm elected, if I'm chosen, then I don't have to, to do anything. <laughs> I don't have to obey Jesus. I don't have to follow his commandments. I don't have to exhibit faith. I don't have to exhibit holiness in my life. It doesn't matter. I'm either elected or I'm not. And so then it, it doesn't matter, right? Wrong. Wrong. If you are his, if you are his sheep, if you love Jesus, then guess what? You keep his commandments. Notice the order. If you love Jesus, if Jesus has called you, you are his sheep, and you hear his voice, that means you obey him. The result is what? The result is the fruit of that election. Faith in Jesus, repentance, obedience. A person who says, I love Jesus, but I don't keep his commandments is a liar. A person who says, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, but I don't have faith, I don't have repentance, I don't have a desire for holiness in my life, I don't care to fight against sin, I don't care to walk with Jesus, I don't care what he says, that person is not a Christian. They can't be. If you love Jesus, you keep his commandments. Salvation is conditioned. It is conditioned on faith and repentance and obedience to Jesus' word. This is the reason why the word tells us, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man will reap what he sows. God is not deceived. The sexually immoral do not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because that's the condition of salvation. But that's different than saying it's the cause 
of it. We can say that salvation is conditional. That is 100% accurate. What condition do we have to meet to be saved? Faith in Jesus, repentance, fruit. Those are conditions of salvation, but they didn't cause salvation. Let me illustrate it this way. In the same way that you would look at a tree that has fruit, you don't say, look at how that fruit on the tree is causing that tree to be healthy. The fruit is not causing the tree to be healthy. The fruit is the evidence that the tree is healthy. The tree has health and therefore it bears fruit. The fruit isn't causing it. Your repentance, faith, and obedience to Jesus is the fruit. It's not causing your salvation. It is the evidence that you have it. It's the condition of the salvation. So if someone does not believe, then they are not saved. The belief is the fruit of the healthy tree. It is the evidence of new birth and new life and the regeneration that we have because of the Holy Spirit. So the third thing I want to share with you about election is really, admittedly, it's really to address an objection to the doctrine of election. Some people, many people still say, even after going to these passages and reading through the scripture, say, I do not like the doctrine of election. I don't like it. I don't like what it insinuates. It doesn't feel fair. It doesn't feel right that some people are chosen and other people aren't. That can't possibly be the way that God works. It just doesn't seem fair. Not everything is equitable. Not everything has an equal outcome. It can't be just. It can't be. I don't like it. This third point is really to answer this objection. And although I won't be able to say everything I would want to say, hopefully this begins to frame your mind into thinking along these terms biblically. And I would respond in this way to a Christian, is that every Christian believes in some sort or some form of election or the doctrine of election. Let me, let me illustrate. What was God's choice of Abraham based on? So we went to Genesis last year. What was God's choice of Abraham based on? When he called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, that he was going to make a covenant with Abraham and make him a nation, what was that choice of him when he was in Ur? What was it predicated on? The answer is nothing. When God first calls Abraham, Abraham is a pagan. He's an idol worshiper. It wasn't because of some merit that Abraham had. In fact, we see this in Joshua chapter 24. Verse 2, thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and of Naor, and they served other gods. So why did God choose Abraham? Well, it's because God wanted to choose Abraham. Could, couldn't, weren't there other people in the world that God could have chosen that would have benefited from a relationship like Abraham had with God? Wouldn't there have been other people in the world that were pagans and idol worshipers that God could have called? The answer is yes. But God didn't. He chose Abraham. He chose one man out of the entire world. He chose one guy to make a nation out of, to make the nation of Israel. Well, what was so special about the nation of Israel was because they were so obedient. They were always faithful to God. And we read, it doesn't take you long of reading scripture to realize, no, that's not true. In Deuteronomy, Moses goes on to say, God chose you not because you were the, the best or the smartest or the brightest. You are a stiff-necked people. You're obstinate to God. He chose you simply because he loves you. That's all. So we see here, at, at least at some point, you have to recognize that God's election is true, at least in the choice of Abraham, in the choice of Israel as a, as a nation. The election, here's another example of election. The election of some individuals to receive miraculous healings and others who don't. In fact, when Jesus preaches his first sermon in his hometown, Nazareth, he goes to his home synagogue and the people there who know Jesus, what do they say to him? Do here, do the miracles that you did in Capernaum, do them here in your hometown. And what was Jesus' response? He says, I tell you truly that in the days of the prophet Elijah, there were many widows in Israel during the drought. There were many widows in Israel. And Elijah wasn't sent to any of them except to one widow in Zarephath and Sidon, a Gentile widow in the north. In the north. Just, just her. He helped her and didn't help any of the other widows. In fact, Elijah would have had to walk past other widows in Israel, Jewish widows, in order to get to that Gentile widow. 
And Jesus says, Elijah wasn't sent to any of them. Well, weren't there other widows that could have benefited from the prophet Elijah and what Elijah did for her? Of course. What was Jesus saying, though? Jesus is saying that it's God's choice whom he heals and whom he doesn't. And that the people of the town didn't have some claim over Jesus, that Jesus didn't owe them something. And then Jesus, well, maybe it was because this widow had some kind of faith. Maybe because there was something internal. And then Jesus says, he follows that example immediately with, well, in the prophet Elisha, there were many lepers during, during Elisha's time. And Elisha wasn't sent to heal any of them except Naaman the Syrian, who was an enemy of Israel. And then we read the account of Naaman the Syrian, and Naaman the Syrian didn't even believe that Elisha had the power to heal him. It was, his, it was a slave girl, a Jewish slave girl that convinced her master, Naaman, to go dip himself in the Jordan River seven times to be obedient. It wasn't because Naaman's heart was just filled with faith, and that's what caused the miraculous healing. And what, does, what was the response of Jesus' hometown folks? They wanted to kill him. They took him to the edge of town. Why? Because Jesus is teaching the doctrine of election. That God chooses who he's going to show grace to. He has mercy on whom he has mercy. Compassion on whom he has compassion. The election of some individuals to receive different kinds of gifts. This could be spiritual or access to material goods, but we see this in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. All these are empowered by the same spirit. This is talking about the spiritual gifts inside of the church who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So we didn't, even as children of God, I didn't and you didn't choose our spiritual gifting. It was chosen for you. According to what? Our will? No, according to the will of God. The election of some individuals to hear the gospel and the external means of grace, that not everyone hears the general call to salvation in the world. Not everyone hears that. When Jesus sent his disciples into the world to tell others, this is what James Boyce and Philip Ryken in their book, The Doctrines of Grace, say. They say when Jesus sent his disciples into the world to tell others about him, By necessity, these early preachers went in one direction rather than another. Philip went to Samaria, Barnabas went to Antioch, then Paul and Barnabas went north into Asia Minor. In each case, a choice was involved. North rather than south, west rather than east. If God was directing his servants at all, as virtually every Christian believes that he was, then he was choosing that some should hear the gospel rather than others, which is a form of election. Boyce and Riken go on to make the point that if you speak to one person about the gospel, then you are not speaking to another person. And even if your Christian friend helps you speak to the other person, there are still millions who are passed by. Election is an inescapable fact of finite human life and history. And this is the rub, isn't it? This is the rub is that not everyone gets to hear the call. Not even the general call of the gospel. Not every human that is born gets to hear this word proclaimed. And this is the rub, isn't it? That doesn't seem fair to us. It doesn't seem just or morally right. And I'll just add for the moment before moving on to address that. And that's the reason why folks like uh, Dr. Tony Evans have begun to shift their theology. And they say, well, that, that means that God must, because that doesn't seem right to me, God must be judging those people, that lost tribe somewhere who's never heard the gospel or, or that person who's never, who's never heard scripture preached. God must be judging them based on a different metric. Maybe there's a different way to Jesus. Maybe there's a different way to the Father besides Jesus. And maybe people in the world, in whatever form they're crying out to God, whether they're Hindu or they're, they're Muslim or they're, they're crying out to Allah, whatever form they're crying out to God, that's what God's going to judge them based on. And maybe they can find their, and grope for God in their own way and find him. And maybe there's many paths that lead to God. And that's the reason why even Billy Graham in his later years began to say that very thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe people don't need to hear about Jesus in order to be saved. Maybe there's another name given under heaven by which men must, men must be saved. And the answer is no. What, what is that? They're running away from the doctrine of election. They're running away from the fact that God chooses some to hear and not others, whether in the general call or in the specific call that speaks to the heart. So these different types of election are similar in principle to the doctrine of election and salvation. Boyce and Riken state this well. What God withholds from one, 
he graciously bestows on another. Lorraine Bettner states this in his work, why precisely this one or that one is placed in circumstances that lead to saving faith, while others are not so placed, is indeed a mystery. We cannot explain the workings of providence, but we know that the judge of all the earth shall do right, and that when we attain to perfect knowledge, we shall see that he has sufficient reasons for all his acts. So I recognize that some may still ask and say, is God just in electing some and not others? In calling some in the way that Jesus says that no one can go to him unless the Father calls him and draws him, is it just? And this was my rub and the reason why I struggled with these doctrines many years ago in my early 20s. This is it, because it didn't seem fair to me. It didn't seem just. And that was because of a failure for me to understand the essence and the nature of what salvation is, is that God's election is based on his grace, not his justice. It's based on his grace, not his justice. Romans chapter 9, verses 14 to 16. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Let me pause here for a second. I do not think that we are preaching the gospel accurately. Let me say that again. I do not think that we are preaching the gospel accurately and biblically if this objection cannot be raised. If we are preaching a gospel that the world is okay with, that the rest of the world thinks is cool, we're not teaching the biblical gospel. We're not teaching the only gospel that there is. And unless this objection can be raised, We're not being faithful to the text to preach the gospel that the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. We have to have this objection being raised if we're going to be teaching it faithfully. By no means, he says, there is not injustice on God's part because of election. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God's not being cute here. What he's saying is he's responding to this and he's saying, listen, it's not based on my justice. It's based on my mercy and my compassion and my love. It's a completely different category. Election is based in justice. Election is not based in justice because justice is about what the person is owed. So then he tells us, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. We do not want to go before God and say, God, give me what I deserve. I'll never pray that. I'll never go before the throne of God and say, God, I want you to give this other human what they deserve. That's justice. It's giving the person their wages, what's due to them. And the scriptures say that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the grace of God, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So years ago, when I said it didn't seem just that God would elect some and others, My thought, my thinking, was that the basis of salvation was justice, that his election was injustice, injustice, and it's not, it is in grace. That is a completely different category. If God was operating solely on justice, then he would give me my wages, which is death. The fact that God chooses to save anyone is his mercy and his love. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has shown great mercy toward us. Election is a completely different category called grace. And so here is the important part, a point for you to understand and to walk away with. Those who are lost are not lost because God has caused it. They are lost all on their own. That God chooses to show mercy and grace to some by electing them before the foundation of the world is rooted in his mercy and his plan of salvation. Election is about God's love and grace given to people who didn't deserve it. No one stands before God and says, God, I deserve your love, grace, and mercy. The only thing that we deserve is judgment. So how does this doctrine of unconditional election help us? How can we uh, take benefit from this? Does this doctrine make evangelism obsolete? By no means. On the contrary, the doctrine of election is motivation to evangelize and expect results. Boyce and Reichen go on to say in their book, if the heart of a sinner is as opposed to God as the Bible declares it to be, 
And if God does not elect people to salvation, then what hope of success could we possibly have in witnessing? If God does not call sinners to Christ effectively, it is certain that we cannot do so either. Even more, if the effective agent in salvation is not God's choice and call, if the choice is up to the individual or to us because of our powers to persuade, because of my intellect and my ability to argue someone into the kingdom, Jeremiah's abilities to to defeat somebody else's arguments and win some personality and gregarious personality to win people to Jesus, if this is up to our powers to persuade others to accept Christ, how could we even dare to witness? Or what if we make a mistake? What if we give the wrong answer? What if we are insensitive to the person's real questions? In that case, people will fail to believe. If that's what it's riding on, Jeremiah's intellect, my winsome personality, then people will fail to believe. They may eventually go to hell, and their eternal destiny will be partly our fault. And how could any thinking, feeling Christian live with that? If, on the other hand, God has elected some to salvation, then we can go boldly with the knowledge that it is not riding on our intellect, on our shoulders, or our powers of persuasion to get people into the kingdom. We can be assured that all who God has elected and appointed for salvation will come to him, even through our frail and sometimes bumbling attempts to witness. This doctrine is useful because it is power for evangelism. It is confidence for evangelism to expect positive results. And this doctrine is also useful because it makes us humble. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. What is not of your own doing? Grace and faith. It is a gift of God. Your faith is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This, we could say, is the just because love of God, that God placed his love on you simply because he loves you. He loves you. Why? Because of something you did? No. He loves you just because he does. He chose you. You were his sheep. And when he called to you through the gospel message, you responded. You heard his voice and came to the great shepherd. Election means that God chooses before the foundation of the world whom he will save. Unconditional means that there is no condition of the human that causes God to choose them. God's election is based in his grace, not his justice. When you come to the place where you see that your election was unconditional, then your heart will sing. It will sing like the psalmist who wrote these words, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew. He moved my soul to seek him. It was not I that found, O Savior, true. No, I was found by you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you sent your Son into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. And what you lost, Lord, was us. And Father, that you have shed through your Son, you have shed your blood so that we could be forgiven. And you have sent your Spirit into this world to give us new life and new birth, to regenerate our hearts so that we would have eyes to see you as glorious. We would have hearts that would believe in you, eyes that would see you as beautiful. Father, that we would have hands and feet to serve you and to obey you in all of our life. Father, we thank you for the great work of salvation that you have done for us on our behalf so that you can receive all glory, honor, and praise, that your name would be hallowed. And we ask these things, Lord, and we thank you for them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand as we worship? I was lost, I was in chains, the world had a hold on me. My heart was a stone, 
Life was covered in shame when he came for me. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms. Jesus, he loves me, he loves me, he is for me. Jesus, how can it be? He loves me, he is for me. It was a fire deep in my soul. I'll never be the same. Well, I stepped out of the dark and into the light. When it called my name, I couldn't run, couldn't run from His presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from His arms. And Jesus, He loves me. He loves. God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and power and dominion forever and ever, and all of God's children set together. Amen. Amen.